Thank you, Mayor. This man is one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history. He won a championship here at the Spectrum and played 489 games at the Spectrum. But there's only one person that can introduce this man. Julia Serving. Thank you. Mayor Nutter, Mr. Snyder, gentlemen, lady, Philadelphia. Tell you what, it really feels good to be back here. It's a little overcast because I guess it's, uh, it's a sad day because the memories are going to be uh, taken away. But uh, time marches on, and this is all about progress. And uh, memories are forever if they're done right. And I think there were a lot of memories that were done the right way inside the spectrum from 1967 to 2009. I'm really happy to be here to play a small role in the demolition ceremony, but I feel as though my contributions to the memories during the 11 years that I played in this spectrum were anything but small. Hopefully. I have a, uh, I have a, I have a, I have a really good friend uh, who lives here in Philadelphia, who is uh, who's one of my son's uh, godfather. His name is uh, L.T. Brinkley. <clears throat> and it comes to mind uh, something that he said to me a couple years ago. He said, uh, do you know what the dash is? I, I remember there used to be a car that was called the dash. And uh, there used to be a race that was called the dash. So I gave him a couple of definitions that just came from my mind, from my heart. And he said, no, he said, this one is the line that they put on the tombstone. Because they put your birth date and then your death date. And then in between there's a line. He said, that's the dash. He said, that's one of the most important things for you to dwell on and make sure that your dash is filled with all the things that you know you had the potential to do and the ability to do. So it was good food for thought. And as I looked at my um, career in the NBA, which was played all with the Philadelphia 76ers, There's a dash associated with that. 1976-77 season to 1986-87. And everything that happened in between is what the dash was all about. And as I look around and I look around and think about the platform that I'm on and I see, uh, to be politically correct, I don't see old people, but I see older people, <laughs> including myself. And in thinking about when I first came here to Philadelphia at age 26, I probably was not as politically correct because I would refer to senior people as old people. So just as a reminder today of your takeaways, be kinder, be gentler, and be politically correct when you see people like me walking around on the back nine of life. Just refer to us as older people. But back to the dash, because it started in a flurry. Uh, my welcome to Philadelphia was great. I only had uh, five minutes of practice with the team. 
and then I was thrown into the first game and fortunately it was against the San Antonio Spurs a team that I was intimately familiar with because I played against them seven times a year back in the ABA so I had a decent game but I remember missing a lot of free throws but more significant as a memory before the game I remember there was a fan who once the teams were introduced, who ran out towards me and he had a bag in his hand. And it was a, I didn't recognize it as a doctor's bag, but that's what it was. And I just saw this guy running towards me with the bag and he was a, you know, kind of a frenzy, almost crazy looking guy who was the Sixers' greatest fan, as you know, Steve Psalms, who's no longer with us but he put that bag he tried to put it in my hand and of course I wasn't taking it <laughs> and then I kind of got the nod of approval from the other people around me and they said oh he's okay so you know that was one of the uh, punctuation points in my welcome to Philadelphia and that first season there were a lot of memories created because if you remember that team, that was a team that went all the way to the finals in the first year. It was a team that uh, featured World Be Free as a second year man. And uh, lots of times when I, as an older person, lay my head down and just nod off and allow myself to reflect back on the past and some of the uh, basketball memories. I can still see World Be Free, who I used to call Shorty Cool, because he was short, he was one of our shorter guys, and he was cool. <laughs> and he used to be a good chauffeur when we'd go back to New York together, right? But <laughs> he said, I owe him gas money. <laughs> but uh, I can remember him in 1977, after the first round of the playoffs, in which the 76ers knocked off the defending champion Boston Celtics seven games seven games and coach Doug Collins was there and Shorty Koo was there dribbling out the clock like Marcus Haynes at the end of the game and as I reflect back on that memory and as I stand here and I think of of that happening in that building you know, it, bling, it brings me a great deal of pleasure. And it also uh, reconnects me with the Spectrum and with Philadelphia because I do con consider Philadelphia my home. Yeah. So since I'm only a small part of this program, there's probably only, you know, one or two things uh, else that I want to say. Um, one is that, you know, when I came into the NBA, or when I went into the ABA after my third year of uh, college at the University of Massachusetts, you know, I went in through the side door. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Snyder's brother-in-law owned the basketball team that I played for my rookie year which was called the Virginia Squires and his name was Earl Foreman and he was a real good owner somewhat of a maverick I think is the term and uh, I played for him for two years and our deal for me to leave college and uh, and become a professional after my junior year at age 21 was consummated at the old uh, airport motel which was no longer there, but the airport's still there, thank God, Mayor Nutter. And that started my pro career period, but uh, my pro career here in, in Philadelphia, uh, what I was saying, it was a side door entrance into the pros, and it was very, very important for me, and I did articulate this to um, our owner, Harold Katz, that uh, I came into basketball through the side door and I really wanted to go out the front door. 
And obviously, the best way to go out the front door is win a championship. But the next best way is to have a farewell tour like I had in 1986-87 that was second to none. And uh, a retirement celebration in this building behind me that was second to none. And, uh, you know, to be uh, heralded uh, for my contributions to the game of basketball, uh, to the city of Philadelphia, you know, by being recognized as a, as a future Hall of Famer and, uh, and one who did make a difference. So the bag in the beginning and the farewell tour at the end are probably my fondest memories. The stuff that occurred during the dash is too numerous to talk about. You know, we, I remember battling Santa Clauses at a game when there were some unruly fans and we had all of our security people dressed up like Santa Claus. And I saw this big commotion up in the stands and I looked up and the Santa Clauses were throwing haymakers <laughs> at the unruly fans. And the unruly fans were returning the haymakers. So we had to like stop the game and check that out. You remember that, man? I was just thinking that Pat Williams might have had something to do with that as a setup. And then of course there was the other fight with uh, Daryl Dawkins and uh, Maurice Lucas. God rest his soul. Just as a piece of information, Doug Collins was the one who started that fight. And I know he's on the road right now because they got a game tonight. But, uh, but he he caught an elbow from Maurice Lucas and he went back at Lucas and then Daryl Dawkins stepped in and said you're a little too short and a little too skinny to go after Lucas so Dawkins jumped in I tried to be the peacemaker and break it up so I caught an elbow and then I went and sat at midcourt I said I'm gonna sit this one out this is not hockey <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're like the star of the team, then the enforcers are supposed to protect you. You're not supposed to be protecting them. That's what it said in rule book, one-on-one. So we had that go on, and then maybe in a closing, as a closing remark, you know, I would like to talk about um, this, the Philadelphia-Boston rivalry. Yeah, it was... Uh, I didn't know until I moved to Philadelphia that it was as intense as it was. But uh, I'm looking out, I see all the Flyers jerseys and the Sixers jerseys, and there's always one or two people who are Boston fans in the Philadelphia crowd. There he is. <laughs> there he is. There's no substitute for bad taste. <laughs> But all these years later, I'm not mad at Boston anymore. I'm not mad at you. But uh, it was really, really, it was really, really intense. I mean, to the point where it got super personal. And in this very parking lot, you know, after a game once, after we beat Boston, I was actually accosted when I went to my car by a Boston fan who was very upset. And, uh, I said, don't you know you're outnumbered like 200,000 to one? <laughs> anyway, he got lost, but uh, the memories are not lost because it was Red Auerbach just to uh, pay homage to, uh, to a guy who was a great basketball man and a great person. Um, he said to me, as he gave me a retirement present, was, which was a clock, that had an inscription on it that said, time marches on, Julius, but memories are forever. So we will hold the memory of a spectrum in our minds and our hearts forever. And, uh, you know, I hope that I can forever be one of Philadelphia's favorite sons. Thank you and God bless you.